Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So yesterday, the European Union celebrated its 60th birthday. It had a party in Rome where the city uh, had the founding document signed and these days it was the EEC. Leaders of 27 EU countries were there to mark the occasion. We weren't. Overshadowing it though, the continued terrorist threat, migration, the Eurozone crisis and of course on Wednesday, Theresa May, she didn't make it to Rome. She's going to trigger Article 50. It'll formally start the Brexit process. The President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, made an appeal for unity at the gathering. Today in Rome, we are renewing the unique alliance of free nations that was initiated 60 years ago by our great predecessors. At that time, they did not discuss multiple speeds. They did not devise exits. But despite all the tragic circumstances of the recent history, they placed all their faith in the unity of Europe. That's Mr Tusk. He's Polish. He's the man that chairs the Council of Ministers, and on that council every head of every member of the EU sits. He's an important figure in what is now about to happen. Toby, we've got to negotiate our divorce terms. We've got to agree a new free trade deal, new crime-fighting arrangements. We've got to repatriate 50 international trade agreements. And all of that's got to be ratified within two years by 27 other countries. Can that really happen? Well, I don't think it's inconceivable because I think it's in the interests of those 27 EU member states to try and negotiate a deal that we can all live with because that would be preferable to Britain crashing out within two years. But I think this is why Labour's position is becoming increasingly incoherent. Keir Starmer has briefed today that he's going to be making a speech tomorrow setting out six conditions mm. which he wants the deal to meet. Otherwise, Labour won't vote for it. But if Labour doesn't vote for it, that doesn't mean that we'll be able to negotiate an extension. That would be incredibly difficult. That requires the consent of each of those 27 member states. So if Labour votes against it, we would just crash out. That's effectively Labour saying uh, no deal is better than a poor deal, which isn't well, supposed to be Labour's position. Labour's position may be incoherent, though, of course, I wasn't asking about Labour's position. I was asking about the government's position. Many people will think that the government's position, given that Mr Barnier, who's heading up the negotiations, has said he actually wants the deal ready by October of next year so that it can then go through the ratification process, people looking at this will think it's mission impossible. It looks literally impossible to me. It couldn't possibly be done in the time. The complexity, the fact that it's 27 countries and the Walloons, uh, and it's the whole of the European Parliament as well. There will be too many people throwing spanners in the works. And quite rightly, we have embarked on something that is truly terrible and disastrous. And the imagery we have of those 27 countries celebrating together 60 years of the most extraordinary, successful movement for peace, for shared European values, and us not there. I well, think... we weren't there at the start, either. We weren't there in the start, but... <laughs> we only fair, we're, we're not there now. now. We, have, we have been, and we have been bad partners while we, while we were inside. But they now, look very happy, now that we're it? leaving, it's... Uh, it, it didn't it's look a, like a birthday party to me, Polly. Well, I think it was, really. I think there was a sense of renewal of... Uh, you know, that Europe exists as a place envied in the world for its values, for its uh, okay. peacefulness. That's why people flock to its borders. That's why they come here. When you look at the agenda that faces the UK government and the EU27, is it not possible, indeed even likely, that as the process comes to an end, they will have to agree on a number of areas, transitional arrangements? I think in a huge number of areas, and they may have to agree that decision fairly soon. I wouldn't be surprised if sometime this year there's an understanding, if not a formal decision, that this is a process that's going to extend over maybe something closer to five or seven years than two years. And remember, on Wednesday, Article 50 will be filed and there'll be a lot of excitement and hubbub, but nothing concrete can happen for a while. You've got elections in France in May, 
You've got elections in Germany, which now really could result in a change of government. Yes, that's a big change. A huge change. This and is Merkel may not be there by October. And who foresaw that even three months ago? Correct. So that's not until the end of this year. So you might be into 2018, really, before you're into the substantive discussions about how much market access for how much regulatory observance. I can't see the whole thing being concluded in two years. I could see, if negotiations are not too acrimonious, that transitional agreement taking well, place. Well, let's just look at that timetable again, Toby. Let's come, come back to that. So the council doesn't meet until the end of April. It meets actually in the middle of the French elections. The first round will have taken place, but they'll need a second round. So not much can happen there. President Along will be representing France. He's a busted flutch by the end of April. Uh, then the new French government, which, uh, I mean, if it's Le Pen, all bets are off. But even if it's Mr. Macron, he doesn't have a party, he won't have a majority in the assembly, the French will take a long while to sort out themselves. Then here's what happens. It's summer. We're off to the Côte d'Azur, particularly the Parisian elite. And then we come back from that, and the Germans are in an election. It may be very messy with the German election now. Mrs. Merkel no longer a shoo-in. It could be Mr. Schultz. He may have to try and form a difficult green-red coalition. That will take a while. Before you know it, it's Guy Fawkes night. And no substance has yet taken place. And yet we're then less than a year before all this has to be decided. Whew. Well, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a big task, and I'm sure, I'm sure Janan is right that there will be some transitional arrangements and not everything will be concluded within that two-year timetable. But actually, in some respects, what you've just described helps those of us on the Eurosceptic side of this debate because it means that there can't really be a meaningful parliamentary vote on the terms of the deal because nothing is going to be agreed quickly enough for them, to, for them to be able to go back and agree something else if Parliament rejects it. So when they eventually, when the government eventually has something ready to bring before Parliament, it will be a take it or leave it vote. How extraordinary that people who have campaigned for sovereignty give us our country back and now say, isn't it wonderful, we won't have a meaningful vote for our parliamentarians we'll on the most important... Uh, we, we haven't, we don't know what the negotiation, we don't know what the package is. We, we, day by day, we see more and more complicated areas nobody ever thought about, nobody ever mentioned during the campaign, all of which has to be resolved. And the European uh, uh, Council, the, the Council and, and the negotiators saying but, nothing is agreed but, till Polly, everything is agreed. You have Parliament led us to... into a catastrophe. Polly, there'll be plenty of opportunity for Parliament to have its say during the debate following the introduction of the Great Repeal Bill. It's not as if there's going to be no parliamentary time devoted to the nature of our the relationship. The final package is what counts. All right. We've got two years to talk about this. <laughs> Meanwhile, there was a big march in uh, London yesterday, a pro-EU march. Uh, Polly Toynbee saying she was there, probably, probably leading it at one stage. <laughs> there it is, all the way down uh, uh, Whitehall from Trafalgar Square. Uh, down to Parliament Square. Lots of people are there marching in favour of the European Union. Uh, and we see the EU flags there, Swedish flags up there, lots of national flags as well, the British one. Uh, Polly, is it the aim of people like you, you still to stop Brexit or to soften Brexit? I think the aim is for the best you can possibly do to limit the damage. Of course, if it happens that once people have had a chance to see how much they were lied to during the campaign and how dreadful the deal is likely to be, if it happens that enough people in the population have changed their minds, then maybe... There's no sign article, of that yet, is Not yet, no. All. But then we haven't even begun. You know, people, people have not begun to confront what it's actually going to mean. Wait, wait and see. Is I think it's just being as close as we can. Is that credible, do you think, to stop it or to ameliorate it in terms of the Remainers? I think it's far more credible <coughs> to try and soften it, but even then the scope for softening it is pretty limited. It's fairly apparent, and I think Theresa May's interpretation of the referendum is that the country wants an end to free movement. There's probably no way of doing that inside the single market. Theresa May also wants to do external trade deals. There's probably no way of doing that inside the customs union. So really, the only line you can defend if you're a pro-European is, well, at least let's not leave without any trade pact. At least let's be Canada and have a formalised trade agreement. Mm. The idea of a very soft exit, where you're in the single market substantially, or you're in the customs union, I think is gone now because the public really did want an end to free movement and the government really does want external trade deals. Depends I, whether, what I, changes I, in Europe. 
Charlie. I, I think that's right. Um, I do think that the momentum behind the uh, Ramoning movement uh, will fall away. Uh, you, will fall away. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the one of the banners being held up by a young boy yesterday, I saw on the news, was "Don't put my daddy on a boat." And I think it gets a lot of its moral force from the uncertainty still surrounding the fate of EU nationals resident here yeah. and our residents in the remainder of the EU. And I do think that David Livington, Liddington's right. That is some of the low-hanging fruit that will be concluded quite quickly. I think once negotiations start, and then that. It'll take a lot of the heat and the momentum out of the Remain movement. Why didn't they vote? Why didn't Theresa May allow that amendment that said we will do that as an act of generosity? Spawn ourselves, we will say, of course, those uh, European citizens here are welcome to stay. It would have been such a good opening move in these negotiations, instead of which she blocked it. Well, I it suppose her line, and well. I've interviewed many Tories about this and put that point to them too, but I think. The, their point quite often is that, that the Prime Minister's job is also to look after UK citizens in the EU. And she Bargaining didn't want to do an asymmetric deal. I think that uh, you have to be generous and you have to assume that people in Spain and everywhere else where there are British it, citizens it, would have the responded. The British government did try and raise that with um, their EU counterparts and they were told we can't begin to talk about that until Article 50 has been triggered. Next week we will be able to talk about it. How generous it would have been, how we would have started right. on a much better if note. If only they'd well, agree to negotiate we about leave it there. It didn't happen. We'll see what happens next with EU citizens. Uh, that's it for today. I've been getting away with it all.